All right, so the last little bit of business before we actually get underway with our Bible study this morning is just to introduce you to our, our panel here that's sitting with me. Uh, to my right, we've got Grant Pram and uh, then Tony Smith over there and Gavin Brookshaw. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us this morning and uh, for, for braving the risks apparently out there and coming in in person to be able to facilitate this discussion with us this morning. So let's bow our heads for a word of prayer and we will get right into it. Father in heaven, we thank you for your kindness and your goodness. We thank you that as we sit here today and the person at home, that no doubt we are enjoying a good measure of health. And uh, we pray in these times that you will continue to protect, that you will continue to bless and um, limit the spread of this, this um, virus that's causing so much trouble and so much suffering and so much loss. Lord, as we focus on your word this morning, we desire to be blessed, uh, stimulate our minds and our hearts, of course, and, and draw us into fellowship with you. And as we try and employ these digital means of communication, Father God, we pray that you will bless us with that sense of community and uh, with a fun time together focusing on your word. So guide us now as we look, Lord, at Daniel chapter 11. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, from the north to the south to the beautiful land. Let's start with that. Let's start with that. What is the beautiful land? And uh, you will need your mics, of course, because our live stream audience will hear nothing if you're not speaking into your mic. Right, what is the beautiful land? Let's start with that. I think that's a fairly easy one. Um, Gavin, you look like you've, you've got that on the tip of your tongue there. Yeah, that's, uh, the beautiful land would be the promised land, wouldn't it? That's, that's where everyone was looking to, or the Israelites. Yeah. Now, of course, in the New Testament, we, we have a certain take on the promised land, that, mm. that it's not a geographical territory on earth. But given the time of the prophecy, what exactly are you referring to there? Yeah, Jerusalem, Israel would be the promised right. land. Yeah. Yeah. So prior to the, to, to the church era, prior mm. to the New Testament shift away from Old Testament Israel, uh, Israel was the promised land, Jerusalem its capital, and then of course as we step into the New Testament era where those geographical boundaries fall away, the church and the heavenly, mm. the heavenly Jerusalem becomes the new, uh, the new focus of attention, isn't it? Yes, that's correct, yeah. All right, now um, we've got kings of the north, we've got kings of the south, we've got struggle that goes on here throughout the lesson uh, story today. This is, of course, prophesied uh, a good number of years before all of these events take place. And my question here as we get started for any of you is why the, why the detail? What, what is the... What is the core intent? I mean, there were things going on all over the world. It's not like this was the only place. And really, we can ask this about any, any prophecy, right? Is we don't have prophecies on South America in Scripture. We don't have prophecies on China in Scripture that we know of, right? Um, why, why this? What's going on here? What's so significant about this? It's a, it's a really important um, part to remember. As, as we said, Israel was... Um, right from the start, Abraham was the blessing that was to be to all nations. Um, so Israel becomes a very, very important place um, of focus of God's people. And so God's people were to show the world um, his love and his, his, uh, his way of, of nice living um, and the blessing of knowing a God that is a true God. Um, so the world is to be focused on Jerusalem or Israel to learn about the true God. So it's really important to see that that's, that's why um, prophecy is based around this beautiful land. It's, the, it's where religion is that's the true God. And other nations were envious of this at times. Um, and sometimes when we get envious, things happen against other nations. And also that um, sometimes even as people of God we can fall away. So God has to bring us back in line. So it's a very important part that at this time we know through the lesson that Israel's been taken into um, captivity, but God is still using them in that captivity. And these are the, the nations that God's using to um, help the nation get back on track. Okay. Any thoughts there, Tony? Yeah, well, the, the lesson is on the, um, the kings of the north and the south, which means mm -hmm. that the focal point must be the centre, the beautiful yeah. land. That's right. And that's where God's people are, as you yeah. said there, Gavin. So, yeah, yeah north, south, and, and centre, central. Mm. 
Yeah, Beautiful that's, a, that's a great observation, point. actually. So, yeah, uh, this idea that the prophecies that are given in Scripture are really about the unfolding of the plan of salvation. And any nation that has anything to do, whether by way of blessing or interference, uh, will feature in these prophecies. Prophecies weren't meant to be a compendium of world events for the sake of cataloging every nation in every place. The, the purpose and the intent of the gift of prophecy was to really narrate the coming events pertaining to the plan of salvation, yes. by extension, the people of God who play a part in the plan of salvation, by extension beyond that, the nations that influence and impact the people of God who play a part in the unfolding of the plan of salvation. <laughs> so I think that's, a, that's a, it's kind of an important point to, to, to just to comprehend because you know, the Bible, if we take a step back and have a more general look, the Bible isn't an encyclopedia of everything uh, across the world at all times. It has an intent. The author, the Holy Spirit, God, who put this together through the prophets, there is an intent. And, and, and intent always guides any author in what they write and what they focus on. Even secular authors. What is the story about is the question. Yeah. So, so that's what we see unfolding through Daniel chapter 11. And of course... Through, other, through all these prophecies. Now, before we actually dive into this and start reading Scripture, just a brief review. We see some parallel uh, throughout the book of Daniel in all these prophecies. Do either any of you want to comment on some of those parallels and, and, and chapters? Chapter 2 began with a, with a yeah. vision of, a, um, of an image. Mm. Yes. Different, different types of metal. Um, anybody r recall what those, off the top of your head, what those uh, what those um, symbols represented? Gold was the head of Babylon. Uh, silver was the um, was Medo Persia. Um, bronze, bronze were the Greeks. Yeah. And then uh, you have the iron was the Romans. And then you have the uh, um, Iron and clay, which is the divided nations or divided kingdoms. Yeah. Now you've stopped just before the best part. And okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> and then, yeah. What's uh, the best part of that story? And then the stone comes, and and the kingdoms crumble. Yeah. Right. Uh, that is the yeah. That's right. Yeah, that's don't the never stop, Gavin, before <laughs> the end, before the happy ending. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, um, Grant, have you got anything for us? I I like how. In all these things, it appears things aren't going well. But at mm. the end of time, God is still in control. Yeah. God, God still has your back, yeah. and he's got something much better for you. Mm. This is um, as, as hard as it is to sometimes understand these things, it's great to know that God has your best interest at heart. He's given you prophecy. He's given us understanding, which we mm. have to thank our founding fathers of this church really for, that um, we're not going to be left alone. Mm. He's with us. Yeah. Absolutely. I love that. And that is the core. That is where we land yeah. in all of these parallels, right? Then you have Daniel 7, mm. uh, vicious animals and beasts. And then, of course, you have Daniel 8, which are uh, sacrificial animals, mm -hmm. um, different metaphors there. But they're actually all telling the same story. Daniel 9 is, uh, is a deepening of Daniel 8's prophecy. So two chapters 2, 7, 8, and 9, and then 11. Now, it's important that we... Note that, because when you get to chapter 11, I must admit that of all the chapters in Daniel, Daniel 11 to me is the trickiest to read and understand. And maybe that's just because I've spent the least amount of time there compared to the others. But, but Daniel 11, it's important to realize that it is part of that flow, what I call the yes. repeat and expand, repeat and expand, repeat and expand. So whenever we're interpreting these prophecies, we know based on the very first one, reinforced by the second one and the third one, that the fourth one is going to follow those same patterns. And if our interpretations begin to diverge out of that, we've got to ask ourselves, why would that be? Because you know, if the, if the pattern is established, then it would hold true to guide us in our interpretation of what is arguably the trickiest uh, chapter in the, in, the, in the flow of this prophetic outline. And, and that's a good point, because 
he gets, uh, Daniel gets quite sick when he's up into this sort of area. He was, you know, uh, Daniel 8, after that, you have the prayer of Daniel 9. So he's into something that he knows is pretty, pretty in-depth. He's really upset. He's fasting. And then, yeah, the revelation's made to him. So, yeah, that's right. It's a, a really important part of expanding what, and he could take, it could show how God works of expanding things um, so that we get, know what, uh, we don't get more than what we need at that time. Yes. But Daniel was progressively um, taken up to it. When it gets to the point where it's beyond him, God comes and intervenes with an angel saying to him and explaining to him. So, yeah, it's a, I like that. Yeah. yeah. I like the repetition here because it's mm. important. You know, I'm mm. going to tell you once and I'm going to show you in a, yeah. the form of a, um, a statue and then I'm going to tell you mm. again and I'm going to use some beast imagery. Mm. And I'm going to tell you again and it's, it's just mm. building up from that. And I think of um, what it says in John 14:29. And now I've told you before it happens, so when it does happen, you will believe. Mm. You know? I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you again, and I'm going to tell you again. And when it happens, mm. you'll know that I am in control. Now, you've touched on something very important there when we talk about the intent of prophecy. Because, you know, we can get all caught up in details, and even, you know, let's face it, we, we have this desire for certainty, especially in uncertain times like we live in right now. Mm. Um, we have this desire for certainty, and I think that often what happens is we try to find, uh, you know, something in prophecy to correlate with every event that takes mm. place, or something in prophecy that explains every moment of life in, in some kind of a detail, because we're looking for some security and some predictability. But it's interesting, that verse, what I'm hearing there is, is the verse is saying, I haven't actually told you these things so that you'll have a crystal ball into future events per se, in and of themselves. I'm actually telling you this because I wanted to establish your faith. Now, that's a, that's a bit of a different intent. Like, why do people consult fortune tellers? Why do people read tarot cards? Why do people... You know, astrology and all the rest of it. There is this human desire to, to, to see what the map is. And yet, the instruction of Scripture there is not so much that I've given you a map of everything that's going to happen, but so that when these things happen, you will realize the Word of God is true. And if the Word of God is true in this way and has a divine origin, then maybe... The rest of Scripture, talking about salvation and how we're saved and who the Savior is, and you know, would take that seriously and it would actually strengthen our faith. Well, it's pretty much if you're not going to um, believe the first verse in the Bible, you know, what are you going to um, put any faith or credit in the rest of the Bible? And we've got another instance here where God's saying, "You can trust me. Yeah. I, I am telling the truth." So yeah, you know, believe the Bible and um, focus on Jesus. Mm. We're in the age of fake news, or at least, you know, as presidents like to call anything that goes against them fake news um, and all that kind of thing. And, and, and to be true, I mean, since the advent of the Internet, we are overwhelmed with uh, this information and that information. You look up any subject, you'll find six different slants on it on the Internet. And so I think, I think especially in an age that has a credibility crisis... This is the crux here, isn't it? Like, mm. is Scripture credible? Mm. Well, I've told you these things so that when you, when you study and when you look for yourself, you'll realize that it is the most credible mm. out of all the sources insofar as it speaks to the subjects that it addresses. Yeah. yeah. I've got a comment here from Leanne who's um, said that I think people do want something better but aren't quite ready to submit. Mm. That's interesting. Mm. So we will often deny... Uh, the evidence of what might be impressed upon us, conviction of truth, but we, the reason we're denying it, we make excuses like, oh, well, I read this and maybe it's not like that, but actually it, it often just comes back down to the fact that if we're not willing to obey, mm. then the only way you can be internally consistent with yourself is to find a reason to discredit it, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. Otherwise, you kind of know you're doing, yeah, it's, it creates a problem internally. Grant, you've had that microphone close to you for a while. It, it looks like you're, you're poised. Not necessarily, but um, as, as that last comment came in, people need, well, I shouldn't say people need, but it takes a bit of a crisis to start opening up and having a look, um, asking the questions, why are we here? What, why is all this happening? Um, and... As Christians, this is our opportunity to say, look, 
this is what we believe, this is why, yes, it's worrying times and we're not, we're not above, we're not above um, not feeling and not, not being in, in it. But this is what my Bible and this is what my God says. Mm. This is what he wants. This is what he wants for you. Um, and and as, as far as assurance, that's, that's what a lot of people are looking for, assurance. I love that point you're making, you know, um, that our faith doesn't exempt us from the trials of this yeah. world and the trials yeah. of this life, but it, it does give us vision and sight that sees beyond them. Mm. Mm. And, and where there's hope, there's life. Where there's no hope, there's despondency and, and uh, well, it's dark and it's grim, isn't it? Mm. But having vision that transcends the immediate is a tremendous comfort and a tremendous strength but it doesn't exempt us necessarily from the trials. I mean, the things we're reading about in this chapter were going to affect the people of God, right? Yeah. And they weren't going to be pleasant. They were going to essentially be caught in the midst of a tug of war mm. between a divided Greece, mm. the Seleucid Empire yeah. in the north, and the Ptolemaic Empire in the south in Egypt. So, so, so when, um, just the, the brief history here, is when, when uh, Alexander the Great, who was this magnificent general, mm died unexpectedly at a very young age, a power vacuum was created, the generals fought amongst themselves, essentially the kingdom was divided um, into four parts. Cassander, Lysimachus, they were up uh, in, uh, in Europe, Europe, what we today we know as Europe and Turkey, uh, and, but the two main players, um, Seleucus and Ptolemy, uh, Ptolemy had Egypt, that territory around there, and Seleucus had what we now know as Syria, Iraq, Iran, the biggest territory, that whole area there. And so when you, th that Iraq, Iran area was also known as the Fertile Crescent back in biblical times. And if you traveled back in those times when you didn't have planes and all the rest, you didn't go from Jerusalem straight across to Babylon, you know, because you would go through a desert. You'd go up and over through the Fertile Crescent where there was, where there was supplies and water and all that good stuff. And so, that, so, so when Jerusalem was invaded from Babylon, which is actually kind of east of them, they would have to come up and over and down, and so that was north. And Egypt, on the other hand, was south. And so through, through here, you have this tug of war between the king of the north and the king of the south, with, as you said earlier on, Tony, right in the center of it, smack dab, the plan of salvation, the nation of God, and all the rest. And this is... This is instruction to God's people of what's about to befall them because they're in the time of Medo-Persia uh, and, and Greece is coming and, hey, you know, this is what's going to happen. So prophecy number one in Daniel, uh, Daniel chapter two just mentions Medo-Persia, mentions Greece. Mm. Then you later on have the mention of um, how Greece will be divided into four. Uh, and then now you have not only the mention that it'll be divided into four, but the tug of war. So, so it's getting closer to the time the people of God are going to be in the center of this and more and more detail unfolds to prepare them for what's about to befall them. And this is the time of faith now, isn't it? Daniel's past. It says, you know, the, 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 um, chapter 11 begins with um, Daniel protecting uh, Darius and then it's quiet. So Daniel's passed away. Greece is coming in. So this is after his time now. Um, it's, not a, it's not a he's there. It's, it's after. So it's a really important thing that this is the faith time of, of as we were talking earlier, where um, it's now, wow, this is being fulfilled. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we'd welcome comments and uh, any questions that might come through via either the Facebook group or by text message. Um, I'm sure that our technical team can put that number on the screen for you again. And uh, feel free to participate with us. We'd really appreciate that. All right, so let's actually, let's actually read Scripture. Shall we do that? <laughs> uh, let's actually have a look here at the first few verses of Daniel 11. And I think we'll, you know, we've done a lot of talking on this, so I think we'll, we'll move uh, fairly, fairly quick quickly through this section. Um, right, so from verse 2, is anybody, uh, anybody, any, any of you want to volunteer that for us? Verse 2 to the end, sorry. Uh, let's go to the end of verse um, 5. Okay. Now I tell you the truth. Three more kings will appear in Persia, and then a fourth who will be far richer than all the others. When he has gained power by his wealth, 
he will stir up everyone against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king will appear who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. After he has appeared, his empire will be broken up, parceled out toward the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised because his empire will be uprooted and given to the others. The king of the south will become strong, but one of his commanders will become even stronger. Then he and will rule his own kingdom with great power. All right, so we've got that, we've got that bit there um, about the being divided into four parts, and then it, now it starts to, from this verse, really go into this tug of war we've been, we've been referencing. Um, verse 6, some years later, an alliance will be formed between the king of the north and the king of the south. The daughter of the king of the south will be given in marriage to the king of the north to secure the alliance, but she will lose her influence over him, and so will her father. She will be abandoned along with her supporters, but when one of her relatives becomes king of the south, he will raise an army and enter the fortress of the king of the north and defeat him. When he returns to Egypt, he will carry back their idols with him along with the priceless articles of gold and silver for some years afterward. He will leave the king of north al alone. Later, the king of the north will invade the realm of the king of the south, but will soon return to his own land, etc., etc., etc. So I'm not going to read all of those verses, but you can see there that tug of war. And I, I often think when I read this, um, you know, if, if someone in Hollywood is looking for uh, another, um, another script, you know, another novel, because a lot of our movies, right, are based on, on someone's novel. Uh, I, think, I think there might be something in here, <laughs> an old-time war movie or something like that, uh, because of this backwards and forwards and the one invading the other and the intrigue and the intermarriage and all of that, um, which is interesting because in Daniel 2, one of the things about the feet of iron and clay, which, which we're told is this attempt to in a time of divided Europe, where once Europe was united under the iron monarchy of Rome, uh, when it fragments, there'd be these attempts to put it back together, right? Uh, but it would fail. And we know historically one of the ways that happened in Europe was the attempted intermarriage. Now, it, it always boggles my mind because I think that sometimes the, the worst fights that ensue are in fact between in-laws. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure how that was supposed to work. But nevertheless, you know, a similar strategy played out here. There's the actual military conquest, and then, of course, there's also the attempts to, um, to, to, to force an alliance and, uh, uh, yeah, through marriage, into marriage and the like. Can't beat them, join them, they try, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's so, right. But it's, it's interesting, though. They still don't learn through history that that was exactly what happened there, was that marriages didn't, didn't unite. Yeah. All right. Now, when you when you um, actually go through this passage here, you end you end up coming to the end of the Grecian Empire. And uh, remind me again, what comes after? What comes after Greece? What was that, Grant? Oh, Rome. Yeah, Rome. So if we jump down to verse sixteen, that seems to be where there is a a, a transition. Um, so we've got this backwards and forwards, uh, the, the Grecian powers, and then eventually that comes to an end, and it simply says, the king of the north will march onward unopposed, none will be able to stop him, he will pause in the glorious land of Israel, intent on destroying it, he'll make plans to come with the mighty of his entire kingdom, will form an alliance with the king of the south, etc., etc. Uh, after this he will turn his attention to the coastland, conquer many cities, he will take refuge in his own fortress. I'm skipping through here. Stumble and fall and be seen no more. His successor will send out a tax collector to maintain the royal splendor. But after a very brief reign, he will die, though not from anger in battle. The next to come to power will be a despicable man or a vile man who is not in line for royal succession. He will slip in when least expected and take over the kingdom with flattery and intrigue. Before him, great armies will be swept away, including a covenant prince. Now, we have encountered that language elsewhere in the book of Daniel. Now, this is one of the things where this parallel is so helpful between 2, 7, 8, 9, and 11, is you're going to find in numerous places where the language here in 11 harkens back to some other prophecy. And we find a prince of a covenant in Daniel 9, don't we? And what does the prince of the covenant do? What happens to the prince of the covenant in Daniel's 70-week prophecy in chapter 9? Any, any recollection on that front? He'll be cut off. He'll be cut off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And uh, then the following phrase there is not for himself or, you know, it's a bit of a tricky phrase in the Hebrew, uh, or uh, he will have none. Mm-hmm. It's this idea that he will stand alone and that his death will be uh, for the many. Mm-hmm. And so we understand from an, an historicist interpretation of Daniel chapter 9 that we're talking there that that, that is one of the key prophecies about Jesus the Messiah. You know, there's a few chapters in Scripture. Isaiah 53 is another one. Mm-hmm. The moment you say Isaiah 53, every Christian knows you're talking about Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it details his, his sacrifice, why he would be sacrificed. So Daniel 9 is actually another one of those really powerful passages that tells us about Jesus, the covenant prince. Mm-hmm. He will establish a covenant with the many for one week, and in the midst of the week he shall be cut off. Mm-hmm. He will cease. He will cause offering and sacrifice to cease, it says. Um, so I know we've already studied some of that, but just by way of review, uh, what, what is that language getting at there? What do you understand by that language? For him to be cut off is his death, and the sacrificial, which was a key part of the Israelite um, um, system of worship, was sacrificing the lamb. Um, so there needed to be, right from the Garden of Eden, we have God gives a sacrifice, uh, sets a sacrifice to show Adam and Eve, how to worship God. That blood needs to be shed for salvation. So that practice went right through to the point of the cutting off. And that cutting off was the blood of the innocent lamb, which we believe is Christ. Um, And with him being sacrificed, that blood supersedes all the others. It's the fulfillment of the covenant that God set up with Adam and Eve, saying the seed will be uh, for uh, f- uh, will be there to cover your sins and, and take away your sins. He will die on your behalf. And so that was a really important part of their worship, that if they followed their, um, if they, they followed the practice, they would understand that, that there would be a ceasing of that because the greater had been, the Messiah had come and died for them. Um, that would be there. That was what we were looking forward to. We look back to, but they were looking forward to. So, mm. yeah. So we're thinking that at this point in Daniel 11, we're really talking about pagan Rome, a transition away, you know, the reference to the Messiah, the prince, or the covenant prince is most likely a reference to Jesus, and that this, who and he was crucified under the powers of Rome, instigated, of course, under Judaism and the leadership of Judaism, but nevertheless, during that period, right? And I think we know that story from from the Gospels. All right, and and then we go on from there. We continue to read about the exploits and all of that. When we get down to uh, verse 29, 29 to 39 seems to be where we transition beyond pagan Rome. Now, again, we have that pattern. Uh, We have that pattern uh, through the rest of the prophecy of Daniel, don't we? Can I just put in here, um, we look at these prophecies, and I know some people like to throw them way out into the future. Uh-huh. Yep. But I think this this little part here about talking about Jesus, and, and we know that it's in the context of Rome, sort of grounds it into a timeline. Yes. You know, it yeah. actually puts, puts dates mm. about when these things yeah. happen for us. Yeah. So when people say it's way out there or something yeah. like that, we can say, well, hang on, no, this is the, the progression that's happened. Mm. And this is where we're yeah. at. Absolutely. Sort of three main interpretations going through the book of Daniel. One is what is known technically as preterism, which is that, um, you know, uh, these prophecies pertain to Daniel and his people exclusively. Whether you're talking about Daniel 8, the defilement of the, the sanctuary, it's all interpreted as historical, before Jesus even came on the scene, no relevance to us, it's just for the Jews of their time. Then when you get to Daniel 9, there's another version of futurism, which takes the 70th week, which uh, talks about the death of Jesus and so on, and that's thrown into the future somewhere, cut off from the 69 weeks previously, and thrown into the future randomly, and it becomes about the Antichrist, and the seven years of tribulation, and the secret rapture, and all that stuff, right? And so it's like there's this attempt Attempt to take the focus off the central message of Scripture, which is actually, it centers around the gospel and the unfolding of the plan of salvation, and, and Jesus is the sacrifice for sin, which is a real, which is a real tra- tragedy, isn't it? Mm. This, is a, this is apocalyptic prophecy. It's like the book of Revelation. And apocalyptic prophecy is different to 
the other prophets of the Old Testament, like classical prophets, uh, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and so on, apocalyptic prophets, they, they give a sequential timeline, and it starts in the time of the prophet, and it goes down sequentially through time in big jumps right through to the major events we need to know about. That's important to keep in mind, and I think that's what you're touching on there, Tony, is um, this is apocalyptic prophecy. There is, you can root this in, his, in, the, in historical events. And so when you, when you follow the pattern, what would be, if we think of the previous, uh, if we think of the previous prophecies in Daniel, what would, what would it likely be to come next after pagan Rome? What's the sequence in the other prophets, prophecies? prophecies? So it's to be divided, isn't it? That's a, a divided... Uh, so iron is, is the Rome... The yes. iron and the clay is now the, the next one to be um, in line. Yeah. So something's being divided here. It's, and, and as we said before, Europe was, is divided in a lot of places, but there's something that's behind it that ties, trying to tie it together. I read something interesting. that You've just sparked a thought in my brain there. Um, I read something interesting a long time ago that when you go back to prophecy of Daniel chapter 2, after the iron comes the feet and legs of, uh, or the feet of iron and clay, uh, that when you look at the language there, it actually has the connotation of creation. Because in, at mm. creation, how were human beings formed? Mm. Out of the clay mm. of the earth. And that it signifies a change in its infancy, at the very first prophecy, already there's, there's a change from straight-up empires to something different. The iron still flows through the feet, because it's iron and clay, but there's this religious metaphor. The clay, this idea of creation, you know, the discerning reader would go back to the, the origin of humanity, uh, God bringing human beings into existence, uh, forming them out of the clay, the dust of the earth, the sculpting, all of that. And so there's this idea in Daniel chapter 2 already that after Rome, although there's an element of Rome that continues, mm. there's this distinctly religious element. Mm. You find that again in Daniel chapter 7. The little horn yeah. that comes up amongst the others, yeah. it's different, it says, to the others. Mm. It's bigger than the others. It speaks pompous, arrogant, blasphemous mm. words. It's religious language. It persecutes the people of God. It, it has these distinctly religious overtones. Mm. Uh, we find exactly the same thing when you get to Daniel 8. The little horn of Daniel 8 mm. does similar things. And there it uses sanctuary language. At the beginning I mentioned that the, the animals in chapter 8 are all sacrificial animals. And that sanctuary language, Old Testament sanctuary language, also flows through in the antics of the little horn of Daniel 8. Mm. He would attack the foundation of the sanctuary. He would um, cast down the foundation of the sanctuary. And, and again, the, the, the language of persecution, the stars of heaven and trample them underfoot. And we're about to encounter religious language here. So you've gone through the divisions of Greece, uh, um, or, or, or unified Greece, divisions of Greece with their tug of war, uh, and then you come to pagan Rome, Jesus is crucified under their watch, and then now we start to encounter distinctly, um, distinctly religious language here. Uh, Tim, Tim is uh, writing into us. He says, suppose I am a Roman Catholic from birth. They care for me or us from the cradle to the grave. They are my mother. It appears to me that you hate my mother. That is what the priest tells me, and I believe him. What do you have to say about that? <laughs> That's, a, that's an interesting point, right? We're about to, Tim's anticipating, we're about to name this religious power that follows after pagan Rome as papal Rome, because that's the pattern through the other prophecies of, of Daniel. And he's, he's asking us to address this idea that it, you know, you're making a critique here about what is essentially the largest mm -hmm. denomination of Christianity, do they not do wonderful things? Do they not, you know, and, and we have the audacity to suggest that Scripture might have a critique on the nature of what that organization is. So what would you say about that? It's a, that's a tough one, isn't it? That's a, I think we can also ask it in our own religion, can we all be true 
to what we believe. Um, you can have something that is good, but as you include people into something, um, they can they can all you know. Um, Adra does things, um, and so there's good people in our church. But we've still got people. We're all sinners. I, I guess that's the way to say. It. We're all got. We're all sinners, um, and you can have. Um, people that believe they're doing a right thing, and and it can be contrary to God. Um, it's not sometimes the people themselves. It can be what they've taught. Um, that's that's an important part. Is is um, yeah, just where you've, your history has a lot to do with how it goes. And certainly, papal Rome came out of a a, 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 a time where m- many gods. Um, and it wanted to unify all religions into a into a part. Um, does that mean that it's a correct thing when you try to pull all things from it? I th- think that's the question. Sort of that could be bounced back as trying to unify people. You're not all going to get them to follow correct ways because they've all got their point of view. Can we ask a hard question, though, of ourselves? Is it possible that we do often say what is perhaps true in an unkind manner? Yes. Yeah, I agree with that. So we can take that on board, right? There is a way in which we need to critique ourselves. Uh, I will often say things to my wife or my children at home, and I'm I'm pretty sure I'm right. But um, what ensues is not always the most pleasant of interactions, and usually it's because maybe I've had an impatient tone, maybe I'm frustrated, maybe I just think people need to get their act together, and it comes through, right? And so even if I was right about, and that's a big if, my wife would tell you, but even if I was right about a particular thing that wasn't right, you know what I mean? The way that we talk about those things is almost the bigger part of the puzzle, isn't it? And so it is possible that people can hear hate, they can hear nasty things, because somehow in our quest for what is true, when we talk about that which we believe to be untrue, we do it in a way which ironically in and of itself doesn't represent the truth. And I think the other thing too is when we're having this conversation, we've got to realise that uh, we're not talking about everyone within that organisation. Okay. And I think we have many yeah, examples so. um, in history of uh, a, a power doing atrocious things, but the people within that power don't do those atrocious things. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we might be talking about a, a big religious movement here, but we're not talking about individual people. Yeah, that's right. right, good point. So we're talking about systems of doctrine, mm-hmm. systems of practice. And yes, people do play their parts in that, but... Uh, yeah, you're quite right. As a whole, it may not be true of the general populace that are living under that system of governance. Yeah. I, I guess one of the things when I was reading this week, um, some other readings to go along with, with um, Martin Luther, when he, when he was having his troubles of where he was, you know, he went to Rome, he saw Rome, he went up, he did all of the actions of, of a good Christian monk. And when he got to Rome, the realisation, the blinds were sort of unfolded for him that here's the church that's so rich and here's the people that are so poor. And it made him investigate more. And he then he was the one that said it's the papacy, a system that is wrong. That is, is wrong. It wasn't, and, and that's the interesting thing, it wasn't um, the Adventists, it wasn't um, the Seventh-day Adventists that identified. It was actually a, a Roman, a, a, a Catholic Roman monk that identified, hey, this is, this is a system that's wrong here. It's not doing what he felt was bringing people to Christ because he saw the suffering of the people outside of the, the church building and he saw the riches of the church itself. And that was his big struggle. That was his, his one where he really started to investigate. And, of course, then we've got the, you know, his 98 thesis that he nailed onto the church to say, hey, we need to identify these. I want to work through these with the church, and, and you know, I'm happy then. But it's where, it's where some uh, system chooses not to do something that it becomes. And he, so he identified it because they were not working on these 98 areas and not prepared to, 
he wanted to highlight them to the people. So it was sort of a, yeah. yeah it's so there was attempted reformation and, and the rest of it, right? Yes, yes. Now, yeah. I think I think as we're, we're running out of time quite dramatically here, I think it's important that, and I'm going to skim through this really quickly, that when you look here, the language is very similar to Daniel 8's sanctuary language. So if you have a look here at verse 30, well, even it starts with verse, 20, uh, verse 30, yeah. Uh, he will vent his anger against the people of mm. the holy covenant. Okay? Yeah. That's the idea of persecution. Um, uh, but will reward those who forsake the covenant. See, this is religious language. Mm. His army will take over the temple fortress, pollute the sanctuary. That sounds a lot like the defilement of the sanctuary in Daniel 8, mm. doesn't it? Put a stop to the daily I haven't used the word sacrifices because actually in the original, sacrifices isn't there. Daily is much broader than sacrifices. It refers to the entire ministration mm. on a daily basis of uh, talking about the Old Testament sanctuary of the earthly priest, which was a prefigurement of how Jesus would work mm. out our salvation. Mm. So this is talking here about a counterfeit, an alternative, a substitute to the plan of salvation. If the sanctuary in the Old Testament was a metaphor to teach us about the truth of salvation in Christ today, then this language here, the problem with, with uh, the papacy, with Catholicism system, that's the key word I'm using, it's not actually a personal attack. It's the, when we talk about these things, it's the fact that you have two alternative systems, an earthly priesthood versus the heavenly priesthood of Christ. Uh, the idea that the, the blood is the foundation of the of the sanctuary service, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The cross is the foundation of our salvation in Christ. The, the theology of Catholicism in its truest form uh, substitutes and amends the blood of Christ, whether it is with the sacraments or whether it is with the uh, indulgences of past times or whatever it might be. There's works that are added to. Yes, there's faith, but there's also works. Protestant Christianity, biblical Christianity, is the idea of there is nothing you can do to save yourself except to trust in the blood and the merits of Jesus. So the issue that Scripture takes is not a personal one with people. Scripture takes issue with the teachings that would detract from Christ and his righteousness and exclusive merits of Jesus in humanity's salvation. It undermines the Old Testament sanctuary's fulfillment in Christ and that's the core problem. Yes. That right there is the core mm. problem. Yes, it persecuted. Yes, it did a whole lot of things historically and geographically that weren't mm. cool. But that's not the primary mm. issue that Scripture takes with the system. Mm. It's actually Scripture's beef is to safeguard the exclusivity of salvation through Jesus Christ. And any system that undermines that, no matter how big and popular it is, is essentially anti Christ or anti-salvation, and that's the fundamental uh, problem here. You were about to say something, Grant. No, I was about to agree with you wholeheartedly. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you had the mic coming up no, to you no, when no, I. No, 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 no. Yeah, it's the tittle, uh, the tittle and the tot and dot, isn't it? That Jesus was talking about. You, that's really taking away those. That Jesus said nothing should be added or taken away, and that's yeah, pretty much. A... Yeah, you know, if you just get a little bit off track. The further mm. you go, the further off track you get. Yeah. You know, so you've got to make sure that you stay on, on the truth there. Uh, I've got a, I don't know if this ties in, but we've got a question here from one of our viewers, uh, Dennis, who wants to know, uh, are the kings of the north and south still around today in some form? Mm. And does this tie in? Yeah, I think as we, as we progress here, you'll notice a change from the geographical language of conquering to the spiritual language. Mm -hmm. And we see exactly the same thing in the language of, or in, in the change pertaining to the little horn in, in Daniel 8. So again, those parallels are key. And so I'd say that yes, uh, and of course we've run out of time now, but in short, kings of the north, kings of the south, it would seem that the king of the north comes to represent the papal system. King of the south, many commentators identify as atheism, and we see that struggle through history. So no longer geographical, no longer territorial, but philosophical and ideological and religious, where the French Revolution pushes back against, destroys Catholicism, Catholicism comes back, forms an end-time alliance. We see this in Revelation 13. I'm really rushing now. Um, you know, and so I think that those, those are the struggles that we still see now in our world today. The main 
Christianity is represented in the eyes of the world and political nations in the main by Catholicism, the Pope. And then you've got the struggle of atheism in the background as well. And these two go backwards and forwards with each other. And so I would say that we're seeing that uh, play out in the spiritual sense today. And you see it in the shift of the language from the geographical, territorial, empire-based to the religious, spiritual, salvation sort of a language. Um, Diane comments and says, Satan is forever trying to counterwork God's purpose. It is hard to understand everything that is going on in the great conflict, but we need to humble ourselves and pray as Daniel did for understanding with these prophecies. We can agree with that, eh? Mm. And I think June really leads us, June Wallace is commenting and, and, and gets us to the, to the core closing point, seeing as we're out of time. She says, I found the last paragraph on Sunday to be full of hope uh, that God's word never fails and God is Lord of history. He has ultimate control, which will lead to the eradication of evil and the establishment of God's eternal kingdom. And uh, I said to you earlier on, uh, Gavin, never end, uh, never stop before you get to the happy ending, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you, that, that's captured here. Uh, in verse 45, he will stop between the glorious holy mountain and the sea and will pitch his royal tents. But while he is there, his time will suddenly run out and no one will help him. No one will help him. Mm -hmm. In the end, this whole religious ideological salvation struggle, which began with the rise and the fall of nations, will end in that place where Jesus has the final victory and the final say. It is the rock cut out without hands in Daniel 7. It is the, the language of a heavenly judgment in Daniel 8. It's the concluding of the, the, the cleansing of a sanctuary. And here in the language of the great controversy, the conflict is finally ended and God's people are vindicated. Remember that the, the, in Daniel 7, the judgment goes in favor of the saints. Mm. God comes through for his people. He is our redemption and our salvation. And that's where our focus uh, needs to be. All right. Well, we have gone a little past our allotted time. For those of you that have been joining us on the live stream, we are going to continue in a moment with a, with a uh, sermon message that I'll be delivering. So please stay tuned. We're going to take a brief little break to... Um, uh, shift a few things around and get ready for that. Uh, so stay tuned because we are coming right back with uh, something spiritual from the Word to think about. So thank you for joining us. Thank you for participating with uh, the text messages, the questions, the comments. We really appreciate that. Thank you to the four of you for being brave enough to take on what, what might be one of the most challenging um, chapters of Scripture on live, uh, live broadcast. Did I mention to you that the whole world was seeing this? <laughs> so anyway, let's have prayer together, shall we? Father God, we thank you so much for your kindness and your goodness. And um, in uncertain times, we take to heart this message that you are still in control. We know that um, in this great controversy between Christ and Satan, Lord, that you've allowed a certain latitude, a certain freedom for the principles of, of his kingdom to work themselves out. And it's not always pleasant. And your people are caught in the midst of that. And the plan of salvation unfolds through it all. And today we stand in that stream of the plan of salvation being fulfilled. We pray that you'll bless us with the faith that will hold on to you, with patience that will endure, and with assurance and peace in the midst of the storm. And we pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.